Hello everyone, welcome to the ICG here at Owensboro. We're so glad you're with us today. and We got a, our family here with us today. We got a, a guest speaker who everybody who watches this will probably know very well. And you know, we're thankful this week, the last couple of weeks from, from my end, you know, it's, it's been rough. Uh, for those of you that may see this, those in this room that you already know this, but my wife, she had an episode, fell down, hurt herself pretty bad. And we're still going through testing and such as that, but she was able to be back with us today. And, you know, I want to thank God for that. You know, he answers prayer. We in God's church, we can never forget that he answers our prayers. But it's on his time, and we always have to remember that. As human beings, we are impatient at times, especially if it's your loved one. But, you know, this time around here, it's... It's like I've always, it's going to be okay. Just got that assurance. But I don't want to ramble on up here all day. So those of you that's watching, remember if you've got any questions at all, feel free to email us. There's a contact button on our local site at OwensboroChurchOfGod.com and be happy to answer any questions you have or give you any literature that you're interested in. And now for our first message, we're going to have our minister, Mr. Mike Partridge. And then Mr. Wayne Graves, the minister from Knoxville, will follow him. I'd like to say hello to everyone. Welcome to the church at Owensboro, and glad to have you with us. <clears throat> when a person realizes the religions of this world are not following the inspired words of God, could this be the start? Think about it. <clears throat> could this be the start of your great calling the scriptures seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened think about that knock we have two people here Dave Wood and Chris Anderson who looked long and hard for God's truth they were devoted to the Sabbath day. They wouldn't take no for an answer. They knocked on many doors. And here they are today. God worked out their jobs for them. It seems like I've known those guys for 50 years. Like I've known Wayne, it seems like forever. Monty Leanne from Louisville, Kentucky. Seems like we've been together forever, doesn't it? Really does. If you are thinking in your heart and mind that the world is turned upside down, what's right is considered wrong, and what's wrong is considered right, God could be calling. Erase all your thoughts, what you've been taught by religions of today. Relate, re, relate, uh, erase them. Think about it. Throw away everything you've been taught and listen to what the book really says. Six days shall you labor, but the seventh day, the day of rest. Death is described as sleep. We do not fly off to heaven and jump from cloud to cloud, like so many religions portray or think that we do. Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth to set up his kingdom and thank God for that because if he didn't there would no flesh be saved absolutely none mankind has the ability to destroy the whole world and they will do it he is now calling his first fruits the obedient ones so he is calling Satan is the God of this world evil minds through Satan. They do not want us to make it. And they can do things far we can't even comprehend what they can do to each other or to countries or to mankind. Satan has to be involved in their minds. There is one mystery that God shows his people that unlocks this Bible. And that's what I want to talk about today. One mystery the house of Israel and the house of Judah. There should be a question mark whenever you read those things. There was for me, and I, 
I wasn't even very learned then. Didn't know much. But I thought, why are we dealing with two entities? Two separate, you know, two separate <clears throat> categories. What does that mean? The story starts a long, long time ago with the family of Joseph and his two sons while he was in captivity in Egypt. Jacob blessed these two sons and Almighty God's power ensured this fulfillment. Their names, Ephraim and Manasseh. Genesis 48, let's go there. Genesis 48. Okay. Genesis 48, verse 8. start there 48 verse 8 and Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said who are these and Joseph said to his father these are my sons whom God has given me in this place and he said bring them I pray thee unto me and I will bless them now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see and he brought them near and said unto them and he kissed him and embraced him and Israel said unto Joseph I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God has showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took both Ephraim in the right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh to his left toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel, his name was Jacob, changed, changed to Israel, stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guided his hand wittily, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, God which fed me all my life long until this day, the angel which redeemed me from evil, from all evil, bless these lads, and let my name be on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. That ought to really be Put a question mark to you right there. Who is he talking about? Well, back, back then they were just called tribes. They were called tribes. <laughs> Countries haven't been formed yet, hadn't been named. But we will see how this applies to the future. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up, held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. It shall become a great people, and he shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his seed, listen to this, shall become a multitude of nations. A multitude and he blessed them that day saying in thee shall all Israel be blessed God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh and he said Ephraim and Manasseh and Israel said unto Joseph behold I die but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers thus Ephraim and Manasseh became part of the tribes of Israel why many people assume that Ephraim and Manasseh were lost when they split away from Judah during the times of Rehoboam. But they were in captivity in Assyria. That's where they were. And when they were released, they scattered throughout Western Europe. Descendants of Manasseh eventually became the United States of America. Descendants of Ephraim, Great Britain, you know, they're brothers. Brothers. Why do you think we're so close to Great Britain? Why do you think the United States comes to the aid of Israel? Just happenstance? Absolutely not. Not at all. When you understand who we are, urgency, sorrow, sorrow and boy, oh blank, I better get my life in order. Should be at the forefront of your mind. Should become a daily routine. 
Christ and his disciples knew exactly where the tribes were. Matthew 10, verse 6. Let's read that. They knew where they were. They weren't lost. Matthew 10, verse 6. He said, Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think one day God's ministers will do that. Very near in the near future. It says here, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. But listen to this, freely have you received, freely give. That's important. James 1, let's go there. James 1. 1 through 6. I just want to pick these up because this is great. These are good words for the house of Israel, for all of us, for church people. Just read a few of these. James 1, 1 through 6. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brother, and count it all joy when you fall into, into diverse, diverse temptations knowing this of your faith work is patience the trying of your faith works patience but let patience have its perfect work wanting nothing if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of god wayne and i talked about wisdom today something we should all praise for we have knowledge but we need wisdom with that six it says but let him ask in faith also not wavering for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind, and he's, to, he's tossed to and fro. Then listen to what it says in 18. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth. And I mentioned this earlier, that we should be kind of the first fruits of his creatures. 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath or anger. These are just good words for all of us. In 22, listen to what 22 says. I spoke about this last week. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding the natural face in a glass. Then in 25, but whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, it's part of this knocking, knock, seek, please, brother. The end times are at hand. They are at hand. We have a country that mocks God. They scoff. They're moving far, far away from Him. So is Great Britain. So are all the English-speaking countries. Want nothing to do with them. If you look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in all his deeds in all his deeds. This country has been blessed beyond belief. Now we have let Satan the devil influence the minds. He's taking over the minds and thoughts of many, many people. One of it is because of lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. The blessings are obvious for this country. We have to be mentioned. The United States has played too big a part not to be mentioned somewhere. From natural resources, a great blessing. From a great climate for crop production. A strong military. Well, you can say up until the last few years, mm -mm, a lot of these things were true. But God's hand is being removed from us. Look at the West Coast. And you that hear my, my, my voice know exactly what I'm talking about. Advanced technology put men on the moon. No other country has done that. One world wars, one and two. Helped stabilize the world. And up until now, we have slept in peace, haven't we? But God has removed his protection and now we have an enemy that is within our boundaries that has reached us. And don't forget nuclear weapons play a role in this. They really do. Great Britain, great blessings from God. 
tribe of Ephraim. Once the world's largest empire covered one half of the world's total land area and one quarter of the world's population. Listen to some of these countries. India, Burma, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Somalia, Sub-Sahara, and even Hong Kong was under British rule. <clears throat> Our countries have truly been blessed, but we are now turning into an evil, vile, vile country to the, part, to the point of selling baby parts through the mail, turning it into profit. Being in the landscape business, I can relate to this. We have become a sick and degenerated plant, withering and rotting at the roots. Listen to these warnings and pronouncements against Israel, against the United States of America, Great Britain. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. It shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe to do all the commandments and statutes which I command you this day, <clears throat> all these curses, and you know them quite well, but boys, it's time to read them again. All these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. You shall be cursed in the city. That's a great one to start with. Are our cities blessed? Just look around. Look at Detroit. Look at St. Louis. Are we blessed? No, we're not. The people love each other? No. They hate each other. It's a world of get. It's not a world of give anymore. Cursed shall you be in the basket in your store, in the fruit of your body, the fruit of your inquiries, your flocks. 21, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto you until he has consumed thee from off the land where thou goest to possess it. He shall smite, smite thee with consumption, with fever, inflammation, extreme burning, the sword, mildew, and they shall pursue you until, they, until you perish. We must open our eyes. All of us must. Anyone that hears my voice and to our church members, get prepared. Get prepared spiritually. Let God be your partner. Dwell in Him daily, constantly. 27, the Lord will smite you with botch of Egypt, with the scab. He will smite you with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Never thought that America would be attacked, would you? But we were. And then we were. Lost 3,000 people, I think, maybe. And half of those they never found because they were obliterated. Mashed to nothingness. Astonishment of heart. We better wake up, America. We really had. Better wake up Great Britain and the English-speaking countries. Better wake up the world. The world better wake up. 28 verse 47. Listen to what this says. 28 47 of Deuteronomy. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness. As God's people, we ought to be joyful and happy. We know that beyond this there's something better. And with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. And it says in 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the ends of the earth, as swift as an eagle flies. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of old age, nor favor to the young. Violent, a violent people. 31, Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people shall rise up and go a whoring after the gods of strangers of the land. And they will forsake me. They will break my covenant, which I have made with them. 
In Evansville today, we have over, I heard it's about 4,000 froggers. These are hot rod specialists in town. They were out there waxing and shining their cars up, and that was their life. When we come through Newburgh, Indiana, there they were at the dam, selling and just doing all they could, just to enjoy their own, their own pleasures. That's the world that we have around us. That's the world. My anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. Oh, they'll cry out to him when they need him, but he will not hear them. They, he will not hear. Because they did not serve the real God. They serve the God of this world. I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, Are not these evils upon us? Why? Because our God is not among us. Let's listen to the words of Isaiah. I'll read a few out of there. Okay? Isaiah. Isaiah 1 will start, you know quite well. Isaiah 1, verse 2. But this is so, so important because it, it labels our country. And you know it does. You know it labels our country, if you hear my voice. Our church people do. We must cry aloud, spare not. Isaiah 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. The ox knows his, his over, his master's, his, and his ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. They are a sinful nation, people laden with inequities. A seed of evildoers, children that are corrupt. Children that are corrupt. They have forsaken the Lord God and they provoke the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are going away backward. It says, why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the heart is faint. The heart is faint. Then in chapter 2, verse 8, listen to this. Your land is full of idols and they worship the work of their own hands which your fingers have made. To those people in Evansville, their cars are more important than anything. They really are. And service to God. Twelve. Listen to what it says in ten. It says, enter into the rocks and hide thee in the dust for the fear of the Lord, for the glory of his majesty. When he returns, people will be utterly terrified. And they will try to hide. But there's no place to hide from his justice. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty. And everyone that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. Chapter 3, verse 9. And this is our country, the United States of America. They show of their countenance, chapter 3, verse 9, of Isaiah. They declare their sins as Sodom and they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Yes, they have. Deuteronomy 4, let me pick up a thought here. Deuteronomy 4, okay? Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 4, verse 27. This is for the end times. End times. 4 verse 27 of Deuteronomy. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, for the Lord shall lead you. For there you shall serve gods the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Then 30, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things come upon you, even in the latter days for us and for our country, if thou turn to the Lord your God and be obedient to his voice, he is merciful to hear. He is merciful. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant that he made with his fathers, which swear unto them to this day. The covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, of which we are descendants. Matthew 13. 
Matthew 13. Verse 3. Speaking in parables here. He's speaking to the multitudes. And he spoke to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower, 13 verse 3, went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. Some fell upon stony places. And they didn't have, they did not have much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun, when the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But listen to this, but others fell into good ground, good fertile ground. God's word is truth. And these people, this plant brought forth good fruit, some a hundred volts, some sixty, and some thirty. Then it says, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. We must provide that good ground for God's word to grow by loving each other, being kind. By loving each other and being kind. A simple, simple fruit of God's spirit. If anyone hears my voice and if you are searching and seeking for more understanding, look to the real God of this book, the words of the God of Abraham. You can write to us and receive the free booklet about the United States and Britain in prophecy, and it will answer a lot of questions. Please open every avenue and street to your mind so God's truth can enter in. Please, I beg of you, brother, we are in the end times, especially what's going to happen to the future of our country. It's never too late for repentance, baptism, or growth. Never. It's nothing more than a phone call away. The sore judgments are coming on our country, the United States of America and Great Britain, and their descendants. Please knock, and it shall be open. Seek, and you shall find. <clears throat> Seek, and you shall find. God bless you all till we meet again. Now for our minister from Knoxville, Mr. Wayne Graves. So good to have you. Howdy, everybody. Hello. It's good to be here. It's always to be. It's always good to be with God's people, right? right. Family. Like family, we fight and feud sometimes. <laughs> we have disagreements, but we learn from each other. We learn from each other. Thank you for that nice sermon, Mike. You didn't get too many of my scriptures. <laughs> you didn't get too many of my scriptures. <laughs> No, I think it fits together real well. Like I say, it's always good to be with family. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. This is the fertile ground that Mike was talking about. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That means encouraging. That means trying to help each other along. Sometimes just listening to our problems and trials and tribulations helps. Listening is love in a lot of cases. Exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day of the Lord. And as we see the day of the Lord approaching right now as Mike was talking about. We also will find the Bible more and more relevant to each of our lives as we go along as the time approaches the end of this age, this era. We'll have to depend on it more and more. We'll have to have faith. And that's what Mike was talking about as well. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. We'll get to that in a minute. I'd like to introduce you to a military term, bluff, B-L-U-F. Bottom line up front, bottom line up front. And it means presenting the most important part of the sermon up front so you can be thinking about it as we go along. That's usually not what people do. Usually the most important part of a sermon or a speech is somewhere in the back part of it. But the bottom line up front is repent. 
That's for all of us. Repent. Anything that we have that's contrary to God's laws, His statutes, His rules, we should repent of those, and we should do it now. There is an urgency. There is an urgency as we're approaching the end of this year, and as we're approaching, things just seem to be getting worse all the time. And the pundits in the, in the news media, for example, are saying that more and more they are expecting a financial crash by the end of this year, mostly September, October. Guess what? September's next month. I mean, time is flying by. Feast, yay! <laughs> Feast is coming up. <coughs> this life and time with our personal calling is our one-time opportunity in the salvation process to make it into the kingdom of God. Our one and only chance. And inherit eternal life. That's important too. Likewise, if there's anything that we need to change about ourselves, and we can change ourselves in about 30 days, we can't change others. Don't try. I've tried. Don't try. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's hard enough changing yourself, but when you try to change somebody else, that's a fool's error. Pray and ask God for wisdom again, as Mike said, to reveal the most important areas of your life that are contrary to Him and that you need to change. Your spiritual preparedness is the most important thing for your eternal life to get you into the kingdom of God. Psalms 19 and verse 12. These are some examples of scriptures that tell you how to do that. Psalms 19 verse 12 says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. David is praying to God to show him the things that he should change. Again, Psalms 26 verse 2. Psalms 26 and verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. So ask God to Psalms 51 verse 10. Psalms 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God can do all that, especially if we're willing to change. Now, do you remember Apollo 13, the third manned mission to the moon? Apollo 13 was April the 11th, 1970. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I remember watching those, those moon landings and everything else. Commander Jim Lovell, Commander Module Pilot John Swigert, and Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes almost died when an oxygen bottle inside the capsule exploded. And do you remember the famous line that they said when they were called back on the, the, uh, to Houston? It's also in the movie. It's Houston, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. America, we have a problem. We have a lot of problems that we can't overcome by ourselves. It will take God's help to do that. They made it back. They made it back April the 17th after a lot of jury rigging and such, but they made it back safely, thanks in part to the people in Houston, the engineers and such, and partially their ingenuity as well, their response to that situation. Now history was not my favorite subject in school. I did not enjoy history. It was dry and dull and boring, I thought. And what good is all this stuff, the Magna Carta and knowing all these things that happened in the past, what relevance do they have to today? Well, Mark Twain quipped, history may not repeat itself, but it sure rhymes. <laughs> may not repeat, but it sure rhymes. Was it Mark Twain that said, 
a good sermon should have a beginning and ending, and the two should be as close together as possible. <laughs> Was that him? Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> we'll try to do that today. But history is important. And as I get older, and as I've lived history, and I've seen all the antiques accumulate in my possession, because if you hang on to anything long enough, it's going to be an antique, and if you live long enough, history, 239 years ago, this last July the 4th, 239 years ago, the Continental Congress unanimously adopted the Declaration of Independence that was drafted by Thomas Jefferson, thereby marking the formation of a new sovereign nation independent from Great Britain, independent from our brother, Ephraim, called the United States of America. Now the 56 heroically brave men who signed this declaration, well, most lost everything. Most lost something very near and very dear to them. A lot lost their lives. A lot lost their property and their families. There was a lot of hardships. These men were very unique. They were very heroic, as I said. There were 24 of them that were lawyers and jurists. 11 were merchants. Nine were farmers. And I don't mean dirt farmers. I mean plantation owners. These guys were very wealthy. They had it made. But they were willing to give up what they had for the better good, for the good of the nation. They were willing to give up what they had for liberty. Some lost their lives in battle. Some were captured and tortured by the British. At the Battle of Yorktown, one gentleman, Thomas Nelson, Jr., noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. He quietly urged George Washington, General George Washington, the commander of the Continental Forces, to open fire on the house. He did, and the home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Such were the stories and sacrifices of the American Revolution. These were not wild-eyed, rabble-rousing ruffians. They were brothers to the people that they were fighting. And they were fighting the greatest military power of the world in that time. Think about that. They were taking on the British Empire, which Mike said stretched all around the world. The sun never set on the British Empire is a true statement. They were everywhere. For the support of this declaration with firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They gave you and me a free and independent America. What are we doing to preserve that? What are the folks that are ruling this nation doing to preserve that? This divine providence that they were talking about, that they were referred to, has been watching over America since its inception. The divine providence. We call it God. We call it God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's go back to 2000 B.C. And in Genesis 22, verse 15. Genesis 22 and verse 15. And the angel of the eternal called upon Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the eternal, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. If you think about that for a minute, think about Hong Kong. Hong Kong in my lifetime has come off the 99 year lease to Britain and has gone back to China. How about the There are other gates 
of our enemies around the world that have disappeared. I don't think that we have any gates anymore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. God gave all this to Abraham, promised all this to Abraham, because he obeyed his voice. Guess what? So should we. So should we obey God's voice. Thus Ephraim, the son of Joseph, whose descendants were destined to become Great Britain, and Manasseh, his brother, whose progeny became America, owe their existence and however fleeting greatness to the faithfulness of Abraham. We owe a lot to history and to our forefathers. Sometime prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11 and beginning in verse 8. And you know this is the faith chapter. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. God told him to go, and he said, yes, sir, which way? To put it in modern parlance. He didn't know where he was going, but he had faith. He had faith in God. He was going to follow him to the ends of the earth. Didn't matter to him. He knew that God was the, the one that he should follow. Verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same product, pro promise. For he looked for a city with hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. You know, Sarah laughed <laughs> when she when she knew that she was going to be with child, she said, not a, not a chance. She just laughed. That's why Isaac was named Isaac. Verse 12, Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, speaking of Abraham, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, and we know a lot of people who have died in faith. Mike and I were talking about that. It's going to be so good to see Dale Sherman and Eugene Robinson and others who died in the faith that we know from Montgomery, the feast site in Montgomery. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were just like us. We're pilgrims. We're just marching along trying to do the best that we can, seeking a kingdom, seeking the kingdom of God. April the 30th, 1789. April the 30th, 1789. George Washington has been sworn in as the first president of the United States of America, standing on the second balcony of the federal building in New York City, the then capital of the nation. It wasn't Washington, D.C., it was New York City. In his inaugural address, he states that we ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself has ordained. After his address, Washington walked just a few steps to 209 Broadway with a group of legislators and local political leaders to pray, to pray the first government, as soon as he was sworn in, he went to pray in St. Paul's Chapel, St. Paul's Chapel. Here's his prayer. Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou will keep the United States in thy holy protection. 
that thou wilt incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, and without a humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. Grant our supplication, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That's a prayer. That's a good prayer. That's a short prayer. It says a lot. Thus this nation was dedicated and consecrated to God at the inauguration and in St. Paul's Chapel at a place that we know today from what happened there on September the 11th, 2001. It's called Ground Zero. Our nation was consecrated and dedicated to God on Ground Zero. We'll see the significance of that in just a second. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 25. Well, this is a, a homework assignment for you. Leviticus chapter 25. It describes the blessings of obedience to God's law and to the Shemitah, the land Sabbaths, as it is explained. So was the terrorist attack on 9-11 during a Shemitah year a blessing or a shaking? A Shemitah year, the seventh year, the land Sabbath year, is always either a blessing for obedience or it's a shaking for disobedience. The shaking has one goal and one goal only. That goal is, you heard it the very first of this sermon, repentance. God wants repentance. He wants everybody to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. He wants us all in his kingdom in our own time. And that's why we're called in our own time. John 6, 44 and John 6, 65. America is in serious need of repentance. We'll go over some of the things that we need to repent of. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The eternal is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he shakes, and then he shakes harder, and then he shakes harder. It's like he's going to get our attention as a nation, one way or another. It's either with a two before or something bigger. Did America repent from 9-11? You know that, no. About two, three weeks, yes, it was a different America. It was the first time that we had really been attacked on our own soil. But unfortunately, it didn't last very long. 1962, 1962, the Supreme Court in two landmark decisions, Engel versus Vitality in 1962, and Abington School District versus Schweb in 1963, the U.S. Supreme Court established what is now the current prohibition on state-sponsored prayer in schools. In other words, in 1962, prayer was declared illegal in schools. In 1963, reading the Bible in schools was declared illegal. January the 22nd, 1973, January the 22nd, 1973. In a historic decision, the U.S. Supreme Court rules in Roe versus Wade that women, as part of their constitutional right to privacy, can terminate a pregnancy during its first two trimesters. What has come of that today? 
what has come of that today is the selling of body parts. Because some of the people involved, some of the doctors involved, want Lamborghinis. Or they want other things that money can buy. And it's quite amazing the number of things that fetal body parts are used for today and used in. It makes us all want to ask God's blessing on the food that we eat and the things that we consume. And remember, this is during the first two trimesters. There are worse procedures. There are procedures where the baby comes out alive and it's killed. Just, it's not killed, it's murder. It is murder. Make no doubt about it. In God's eyes, it's murder. We have killed over 58 million babies. And that's what they are, babies. Some would say up to 100 million. That is a generation, folks. That's a third of our population right now. Think where we would be as a nation if all those people were alive today. Just think for a moment. One of those babies that have been murdered may have been the person to discover cancer, cure. May have been the person to discover a new way to communicate, a new way to create energy to make our lives easier, better, safer. And yet what happened? We killed her. We killed her. Jeremiah 32 and verse 35. Jeremiah 32 and verse 35. This is talking about Israel and Judah. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire into Molech, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Israel and Judah both offered their children by fire to Molech. They offered thousands to Molech. We've offered millions. Who's the greater sinner? Who is in greater need of repentance and forgiveness? And why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Let's look at Genesis 13, verse 13. Genesis 13, verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the eternal exceedingly. Moving on over to Genesis 18, verse 20. Genesis 18, verse 20. This is another reason why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And the Eternal said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. Time is very short. We can look around us and see various things happening that give us indisputable evidence that the time is very short, that it's a wicked nation, that there are things that we're doing that are contrary to God's judgments and laws and rules and commandments. I listened to a Baptist minister's sermon on the internet the other day. He gave a 30-minute sermon, and this was in one of the mega churches in Knoxville, Tennessee. About 3,000 people or so attend this church. And I've been there to one service at the invitation of a friend. And as Garner Ted has said in the past, that a member of the Intercontinental Church of God can go anywhere that they want to go. They can read any literature that they want to lead, read. They can listen to anything that they want to listen to. You can 
it's not always the, the best thing to do. You can get confused that way. But at the invitation of a friend, I went here. And the sound system that they have at this church, I'm sure cost more than the entire headquarters building in Tyler, Texas. The sound system, you may not feel the Holy Spirit, but you feel the reverberations of the music in the church. It's incredible. I say time is short. Well, he said twice that everyone has an immortal soul and that you will spend eternity in either one of two places. And he went, heaven or hell. That bothered me. And it's the same lie that Satan said in the Garden of Eden to Eve. Genesis 3 and verse 1. Genesis 3 and verse 1. To pick up the context. Now the serpent, the nephesh, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the eternal God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He's putting some doubt in her mind. Satan is very subtle, even today. Don't discount him. Don't discount him. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now the touching part was a mistake. That wasn't a lie. She just didn't understand for whatever reason. But God did not say that. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. That's the first lie the first documented lie in the Bible. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world is Satan the devil, even though Christ qualified to replace him as the God of this world. He hasn't done so yet. So Satan is still here on this earth. He's still, he's still telling all the things that we do to God. He's the accuser of the bread there, if you will. Now there is a huge conspiracy in the world today to eliminate and destroy about six and a half billion people. The earth has seven billion people right now. And the Georgia Guidestones and the elite of the world would like to see 500 million people on the earth living in perpetuity and in harmony with nature. 500 million. It ain't you and me. They're not talking about us. They don't want us, that's for sure. But somehow six and a half billion people have to be done away with. And really, if you think about Satan and all of his names and his modus operandi, he wants all of us dead because we will attain as children of God, as sons of God, what he aspired to. And he understands that. He understands not totally the plan of God, I believe, but he understands enough to hate us. And each of you, if you look in the mirror over your shoulder like this, you'll see a big bullseye on your back. That's the bullseye that Satan the devil is aiming for. So be careful. Be careful. Revelation 12 and verse 12. Revelation 12 and verse 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, ye, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And if you want to jolt your system away and alert, just read the Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21. Those are the 
end time scriptures. The life cycle of a nation. Just like everything, nations have a life cycle. They're born, they grow, they mature, and they decline and die. And that's happened throughout history. Our founding fathers were collectively the brightest, wealthiest, and most powerful men of their era, their time. They risked everything that they had by declaring their independence from what was, at that time, the greatest military and economic power in the world. Quite frankly, we've not seen such intellect, innovation, and testicular fortitude at the helm of our country since then, and I believe we'll never see men of such strong backbone in our government again. Just over 200 years later, England is a shadow of its past world dominance, and the United States has fallen so far away from the country that our forefathers created for us that they would shed tears of dismay if they could walk among us today. They would roll over in their graves, as the expression goes. History provides a roadmap of where the U.S. is headed. Is our demise inevitable? No, it's not inevitable. It doesn't look good, though. If we study the past and make the difficult yet proper decisions, if we repent to prevent history from repeating itself in our country, as it is done with every group, every group of people before us, from every culture imaginable. Only if we do that can we turn things around. And I personally don't think things will be turned around until Jesus Christ himself comes back to rule this earth. Consider this. About the time our third, original 13 states adopted their new constitution in 1787, Alexander Tyler, a Scottish history professor at the University of Edinburgh, had this to say about the fall of the Athenian Republic some 2,000 years earlier. Again, he's talking about history 2,000 years ago. Plus, a democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. And we know that we have a republic, which is a representative democracy. Democracies aren't always good. You've heard the joke about two wolves and a sheep voting for what's for supper. <laughs> two wolves and a sheep. Okay, you can imagine what, how that vote's going to go. <coughs> Lamb chops, did you say? <laughs> a democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always vote for the candidates who promises the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy which is always followed by a dictatorship. And the average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. Remember what I said how many years ago from this last July the 4th our fathers met to sign the Declaration of Independence? 239 years. Are we overdue? During those 200 years, those nations always progressed through the following sequence. It's like a time sequence. It's like step one, step two, step three. It's like a recipe even. From bondage to spiritual faith. From bondage to spiritual faith. Think of Israel. Think of Israel going through these stages. From spiritual faith to great courage. Did they do some great exploits? Eventually, yes, they did. From courage to liberty. Thanks to God, they were free. From liberty to abundance. Think of the promised land. Think of Canaan. Think of all the abundance there. I want to see those grapes. <laughs> I want to see those grapes. Maybe make some wine from them or something. I'll drink to that, right? I mean, were the grapes this big? Or were they this big? Or how big were they? I mean, it took two men to carry a cluster of grapes. So I'm curious about that. 
I'm just curious. From abundance to complacency. I have a friend that says prosperity rots the soul. Prosperity rots the soul. You get too you get too much, you get too complacent, and you focus on the little things. Look at all the little nit noy things that we're focusing on today. Like a Medal of Honor winner veteran who's not allowed to fly his flag at his condo. That's silly. Let's focus on the real issues. Let's focus on the real issues of this country, this nation. The physical irresponsibility, for example. We have $19 trillion in debt. $19 trillion. You think we'll ever repay it? I don't. I don't think so. Okay. So from abundancy to complacency. Abundancy to complacency. From complacency to apathy. Well, these laws don't apply to me, so I'm exempt, so I'm not going to worry about it. That's apathy. From apathy to dependence. From apathy to dependence. And from dependence back into bondage. Dependence to bondage. So where are we in the historically proven life cycle of nations? Professor Joseph Olson of Hamline University School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, points out some interesting facts concerning the 2000 presidential election. It's been a while ago, but I think the point can still be made. Number of states won by Democrats, 19. Republicans, 29. Square miles of land won by Democrats in the 2000 election now, 50, 580,000 square miles. Republicans, 2,427,000 miles. Population of counties won by Democrats, 127 million. Republicans, 143 million. Murder rate per 100,000 residents in countries or counties won by Democrats. Murder rates per 100,000, 13.2 for Democrats. For Republicans, 2.1. This Professor Olson adds, in aggregate, the map of the territory that Republicans won was mostly the land owned by the tax-paying citizens of this great country. Democrat territory mostly encompassed those citizens living in government-owned tenements and living off various forms of government welfare. And this is an important aside to all of us. Anyone who gets involved in politics in this era today to the detriment of his walk in the salvation process is foolish. The most important thing that we have in our lives is our spiritual lives. Nothing in this life or on this earth is as important to us as attaining the kingdom of God and the promises that God has given us as his children I say that I am a, an official political atheist. I'm a political atheist. I think that's a good place to be. I now understand and I see why there will be no human rulers in the world tomorrow. None. Zero. Nada. Zip. Only spirit beings will rule in the world tomorrow because humans just don't have the ability to fairly and consistently govern. If, you, if your support of a political party or a candidate is a stumbling block to yourself or to others, I would suggest, and I'll point, a fing, I'll point three fingers back at me and point the finger out here, I would suggest that all of us make it our 30-day goal to repent and to discern the facts, though it is difficult through all the political smoke and mirrors that we see today. In other words, don't get involved in politics. Don't use it as a stumbling block. The church's official policy is that whether you vote or not is irrelevant. It's whatever you consider your duty to be or not. It's called a personal element of belief. 
personal element of belief. Olson believes that the United States in the year 2000 is now somewhere between the complacency and apathy phase of this definition of democracy, with some 40% of the nation's population already having reached the governmental dependency phase. This is the year 2000. 15 years from now, where are we? We are far into dependency, in my opinion. What comes next? Bondage. Always happens that way. We'll see. I wouldn't bet against it. Again, the life cycle of nations is proven over thousands of years. The only way that we can avoid the inevitable fall of the USA is to recognize the historical path that we are following and make the difficult but needed decisions to turn our country around by once again placing emphasis on personal individual responsibility and liberty rather than on government bailouts and entitlements for the masses. And I am not positive that this turnaround is possible. Instead, I pray for thy kingdom to come. That is the ultimate answer, and that should be our ultimate goal. It's hard to say, but America is getting what it deserves. God is just. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. Do you have any doubt about that? That we're getting what we deserve? I do believe that he's shaking us like he did Israel and Judah, giving us yet another chance to repent and return to him. We are being destroyed by traitors from within, by open borders and illegal aliens flooding into the country, by thousands of Muslim resettlements, a cloud piven strategy to bankrupt America by entitlements, executive orders nullifying the Constitution and Bill of Rights, by multiculturalism, since immigrants no longer integrate into the melting pot that was once America. The Irish, the English, the Spanish, whoever came to America became Americans. You didn't have hyphenated words. You didn't have Afro-Americans. You didn't have native Indian Americans. You had Americans. We were one. We were united. There's more divisiveness in the nation now than I've ever seen, certainly more than a few years ago. Frederick Bastiat said, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. They make laws to enrich themselves, and they think that they're doing the right thing. They glory in enriching themselves from the system. So what should we do? Some things. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We're supposed to provide for our families. Guess what? We're all family. We're supposed to help each other. That's why we're supposed to pray for each other too. Not only for the people in the congregation that we know, but people in other congregations that we don't know. I typically visit four congregations around Knoxville. There are a lot of sick people. There are a lot of people who need your prayers. You don't need to know all the names. Just ask God to remember those of us who are sick and afflicted. He knows their names. He knows their conditions. He made them. If he makes them, he knows how to fix them. Proverbs 27 and verse 12. Proverbs 27 and verse 12. And you can make a note, Proverbs 22, verse 3 says the same thing. Proverbs 27, 12, and Proverbs 22, 3. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. That's the NIV version of that verse. If you see danger, do something. 
If you see problems coming, do something. Prepare as best as you can for the evil and troubles that you will see coming and that you see coming now. Did you know that if you do not prepare, you're actually sinning and tempting God? You're sinning and tempting God, just like the Israelites did. You know, some people will say, well, it's showing a lack of faith if I try to get food or water or something like that in case the power goes out or in case the water supply is contaminated. No, it's tempting God if you don't. Deuteronomy 16, or Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. Deuteronomy 6.16 6 says, You shall not tempt the eternal your God as you tempted him in Massa. And Matthew 4 and verse 7. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, speaking to Satan, Thou shalt not tempt the eternal thy God. Now the Adam Clark commentary helps out here. The commentaries are written by a very learned gentleman. And they help us to understand, if we use wisdom, what's being said in the Bible. I like the commentaries. Adam Clark is one of the better ones. And we'll listen to Adam Clark and also Jameson Fawcett Brown. Adam Clark, verse 7, Thou shalt not tempt to expose myself to any danger naturally destructive with the vain presumption that God will protect and defend me from the ruinous consequences of my imprudent conduct is to tempt God. Don't jump off buildings. Don't walk off the side of a building. Don't try to walk on water that's over your head if you can't swim. And like I say, don't stick paper clips in electrical outlets. That's not a good thing to do. The Jameson Fawcett Brown, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, as if he should say, true, it is so written that he'll protect his, uh, protect him uh, since his heel would be bruised by a stone or something of that nature. And on that promise I implicitly rely, but in using it there's another scripture which must not be forgotten. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Preservation in danger is divinely pledged. Shall I then create danger either to put the promised security skeptically to the proof or wantonly to demand a display of it? Don't expect God to do something if you're trying to tempt Him. Or if you don't do anything at all, don't expect Him to help you out. That were to tempt the eternal my God, which being expressly forbidden, would forfeit the right to expect preservation. That's the end of the Jamin Fawcett Brown commentary. Leviticus 26 and verse 31. As we, we're coming to a close here. Leviticus 26 and verse 31. And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries into desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land to desolation and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. It will be such desolation that our enemies will just open their mouths in awe. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. It's talking about the Shemitah years again. And look, as Mike was saying about California, the drought has been there for about four years, I believe. And it's getting serious. A lot of our food comes from California. About half of our food. Some things, like almonds, I think is one of their leading exports. And that's 90% plus. Fresh fruits and vegetables. You know, a lot of them, a lot of the citrus fruits come from California as well. What's going to happen there? What's going to happen there? A natural course of events in a region or a nation is drought, famine, pestilence, and war. Drought, famine, pestilence, and war. An economic collapse, according to 
multiple authors now. It's almost inevitable. It won't work. It means your banks will be shut down. Maybe like in Greece or in Cyprus, you can only withdraw like $60 a day. How would you like to send it, stand in a, a line a block or two blocks or more long just to get 60 bucks? And you got to do that every day to live. That's not too good, is it? That may be coming in an economic collapse. So how do you prepare? You can figure that out. You're all smart people. Physically, water and food are very important for survival. You can live three days without water. You can live 30 days without food, but it ain't gonna be pretty. <laughs> it's not gonna be fun. Think and pray about how you should prepare as best as you can for what you see coming in the future. Do what you can do. Rely upon God, trust in Him to do what you can't do. Talk to others about what they see as the coming physical dangers and do your best to prepare and to mitigate them. In the same way with your spiritual preparedness. Spiritual preparedness, and again I go back to Mike, is each of our most important eternal tasks, spiritual preparedness. Ephesians 6, you know where I'm going with this one. Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's not a fair fight. Remember, Satan and the demons were created before the earth was created. He's been around a long time. He's a smart being. The demons that are with him, a third of the angels, are also very smart beings. And they don't have your best interest at heart. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Our principal goal should be to always be in the center of God's will. And there are two perfect places of safety. Two perfect places of safety. One is being in the center of God's will. The other is the grave. Two gentlemen that we mentioned earlier. They're in their graves. They have been called and they have been chosen. They're safe. We'll see them again. Each of us should be in a state of perpetual repentance, humbly and with a contrite heart, loving, fearing, and obeying our Heavenly Father. Our tabernacling in this life should always be a striving to emulate our perfect example, Jesus Christ. We shall not fear, as we will be prepared physically, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually, for whatever comes in this era. One last scripture, Hebrews 12, 12. Hebrews 12, 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the starrooks. It says cross, but I did look it up in the interlinear, and it is starrooks. Despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ is our intercessor. He's our elder brother. He's got our best interest in heart. He's there for us. So brethren, pray earnestly, urgently for the kingdom of God to come and soon.